Texas without a solid economy here, I mean, none of us can be here. Our farm was, was started in 1855 uh, by Hayes, uh, who was part of the family that moved here to Elizabethtown. Um, North Bend, which is where the, the, the farm is located, was one of the first settlements in this area, even earlier than, than Cincinnati. Just shy of 300 acres. I'm the sixth generation. Um, I, have, I have kids. Don't know if they're going to be interested in farming. They're only the oldest is only 18 months, so we have a ways to go still. But uh, my cousin's kids come down during the during the summertime, and, and they help out when they're when they're out of school. So fifth, sixth, and seventh all working together at one time a lot. So one of our primary products here is what we call a micro mix, salad mix, and that consists of a lot of baby green. Basically, these guys aren't in the ground for much more than. 30 days. But the best part about it is that it doesn't take up an awful lot of real estate here. I plant uh, one week's worth every week. So that would be five of these beds that you see behind me every week to fill all of our obligations for this crop. But primarily we focus on the greens and the root crops here. Our soil is really nice and um, finely textured, so we get some really great carrots out. We do a lot of turnips, radish, the potatoes, beets. Onions is going to be another really big part of the crop that we'll probably do an equal volume in onion as we do potatoes. But we'll harvest, uh, I think last year we harvested right around 9,000 pounds of produce just off of these three large plots in that, in that bottom plot. And um, we've got a four-fifths of an acre plot further down the road that we're going to use this fall for, uh, for our garlic production so we can move our garlic out of the garden and use that space for more for more lettuce and, and radish production. But what, what you see here is basically our non-floodplain ground and it only amounts to about two acres as far as the garden's concerned and 12 acres overall as far as the you know the farm buildings and where the stables are and where our hillside dining is going to be and our food forest forage area and stuff so here's where the brick oven is going to be so we can do like wood-fired pizzas and things like that i believe there will be seating for 20. a little mini herb garden up here so that chefs can you know pick things right right there and then use it in the food that they're preparing. We've got the conventional crops and we don't promote the fact that we do a lot of conventional crops. We're always open about it, but we don't go, hey, we also do a lot of conventional crops. Um, but we're, as we try to get away from that, we're like, well, what do we do to supplement that? And like, well, there's beekeeping. The bees have been awesome. Local, demand for local honey is probably the highest it's ever been. And, it, and we cannot produce enough honey to meet. Yeah, I, so, I got interested in bees a about six years ago, found an old beehive of my great-grandfather's, uh, an old Langstroth style. If any beekeepers watch this, it was the kind of the front porch on the bottom with the swing back top lid. Very cool. Um, and then I got really intimidated by beekeeping because, I mean, there's a lot of information and there's no real formal education or training for beekeeping, at least for most of them. I know there's probably a couple of universities out there that offer it. And I went to a couple of open hive demonstrations for, uh, that the local clubs put on and I just decided to stick my, my toe in the water and get bees. I got four colonies of bees and um, this year we went into winter with 34. So that's... Um, or 32. Been beekeeping now, uh, what, four years, I guess? What we're hoping to do here is make enough money doing our organic crops to justify taking more of the acreage away from the more commodity crops. Because as of right now, they make the most money. It's difficult to justify reallocating that space for something that isn't going to bring in as much of an income. But we're finding, especially with our garden crops here, that they are as profitable. And while it's more labor intensive, it's a better use of the land. Having this close linked network of, of from, from, from the soil to the table. And uh, I don't know. So we started growing food rather than the commodity crops. Because I always consider, when we grow corn and soybean, I don't look at that as food. Uh, I look at it as, it's, it's almost like it, it was oil. It's, it's traded on the stock market, 
there's a whole lot of things that, that in the real world would not affect the price of a bushel of corn. Um, and and I, I look at it almost as if it's like play crops in a way. I mean, it's, it's, it's just not, there's, there's, there's a detachment that I have that I, that I just, I don't have, I'm, I'm growing or, this, this, this organic open pollinated corn that has three different varieties of corn that I interspace plant together where I'm trying to create our own little hybridized version of these heirloom corns that have a nice sweet flavor. They have a taller stalk so I can move them off the back of our our hillside and down in the floodplain so they better compete with weeds. So we don't have to use a herbicide or anything like that. We can just cultivate. And the flavor is just, I mean, fantastic. So right? what we have here is our season extension experiment from last fall. What we did is uh, around the end of October, we built these hoop tunnels just to see how well some of our main crops would do over winter without any additional heat or light. One of the real benefits to season extension is that if you do it right, you can have really nice produce all through the year. And once you get into those dark days, there are not a lot of growers that have greens all year round. So we can also charge a premium price for those items if we take the time and effort to do the process properly. And it looks like this experiment is, for all extents and purposes, very successful. The horse operation provides all of the manure that we compost to put on our potato crops, as well as uh, amend to all of our gardens every year. So they're, they're closely interlinked, even though they are kind of individual businesses. When you cut a head of lettuce, that lettuce has a finite amount of time before it's turned into something you cannot use. It rots, dries out, whatever. Um, so the nice thing about a local food economy is that you're getting the stuff as fresh as possible, which means your waste is much less. Restaurants have a huge amount of waste. It's just the nature of supplying food to somebody who's gonna create dinners with it and, and the waste associated with that. One of my favorite customers was this sweet elderly black woman who loved post chard because it had bug holes. She said if it was good enough for the bugs to eat, it was good enough for her. And she said that she really didn't trust the things she saw in the supermarket that were perfect. By the restaurants buying locally, that, that restaurant dollar, that, that dining dollar that, that consumers spend um, rather than going into a national chain, goes to a local restaurant. That local restaurant is paying their employees, which are all local people, the chef's local, the owners, if it's a small one-off restaurant, uh, the owners are local as well. All, that, all, that, all those dollars are going back into the local economy. They, in turn, are buying local product from me. My dollars, I think we, we went through and checked, tried to figure it out, on, real loosely, but right around 65 to 70 percent of the dollars that this farm spends gets re-spent back in the community. We're doing a lot of manually intensive forms of growing here, as do a lot of other small growers. Our diesel fuel footprint to make this food, you know, the 9,000 pounds that was generated here, is significantly less than what was required to do the corn out in the field. More people are eating this than they're eating the corn. And we're able to get that to market without being impacted nearly as much as, as a large produce grower in California trying to ship stuff to, to um, Kroger's or, or uh, Big. So essentially, we're protecting consumers in, in some ways from that you know, peak oil price. It, it's fun and exciting. We're growing things now because people are willing to buy locally. This didn't happen because, because we just wanted to make local food, produce local food, grow local food. We did this because people were willing to buy, spend money and, and treat me as a farmer as if I were somebody else making you know a, a living doing something else that we value as a high value job. And it's a lot of fun to do. It's nice being able to plant stuff every week and then have it 
turn over so quickly and be able to start new again in a month? Extremely rewarding. Uh, there's nothing more entertaining or not even entertaining, relaxing, um, bonding with nature than, than just sitting there eating your lunch, watching the bees go in and out of your hive. And you open up the hive and if they're nice and friendly, there's just this nice tone that comes out. There's this nice smell about it. And you get honey. And we, hunt, we harvest honey. We harvest local pollen, um, uh, both for, for cooking with and for people that want to try it as a uh, homeopathic remedy for their allergies. Um, and we're starting to harvest the propolis. No, it's like we're having the best time in the world. We're actually, we're actually working. We're not worrying about what the market does, you know, what corn's going to pay out six months from now because we're growing something that we're turning around and selling 30 days after we plant it most of the time. And uh, it's just fun now. And that's, that's how this all started. It's just I lost my job and I found something better.